Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Industry 4 and in Action webinar, which is part of the Callaghan Innovation Industry 4 Demonstration Network Program. I'm Catherine Lai, and I am the Head of Advanced Manufacturing and Export Communities at the EMA, that's the Employers and Manufacturers Association. And I'm delighted to have Jonathan Lee, the Operations and Quality Manager at Oasis Engineering, join me on today's webinar focused on shop floor intelligence and the difference two years has made since Oasis Engineering completed the Smart Industry Readiness Index Assessment as part of the Industry 4 Demonstration Network Programme. Now, before I invite Jonathan to share his insights and learnings with you all, I'd just like to spend a few minutes providing a high level overview of the Industry 4 Demonstration Network Programme. So this is a government initiative to help New Zealand manufacturers realise the benefits of a range of industry four technologies, which are all designed to enhance manufacturing performance, output, monitoring and control. So industry four, it's the convergence of a range of these technologies, AR, VR, AI, 3D printing, industrial internet of things, robotics, automation, digital twins. So combined, these represent a significant opportunity to improve operational efficiency, quality, and business intelligence. It's those data-driven decision-making in real time that's hugely valuable and will make the difference for businesses. But knowing when and how to incorporate these new technologies into your business model isn't easy. And the Industry 4 Demonstration Network Program is here to help you adapt. So Callaghan Innovation have teamed up with uh, official partners, Becca and the EMA, to deliver the Industry 4 Demonstration Network, which consists of three activities. Now, the first is a virtual smart factory tour, which enables you to see what a high level of Industry 4 integration looks like across a highly advanced factory here in New Zealand, and that's Nortec Electronics. So Nortec Electronics, they were taken through the Surrey assessment and they were ranked best in class, that's the top 10% of manufacturers globally who had been through the Surrey assessment and over 1500 manufacturers globally have been through this assessment. It's an interna internationally recognized assessment developed in Singapore and adopted by the World Economic Forum. The process, the Surrey assessment process assist, assesses your business for industry for maturity across 16 dimensions that fall broadly into three categories, people, technology, and processes, and prioritizes the key dimensions that will deliver the best returns and growth for your business. The outcome is a benchmarking against your peers globally and within New Zealand, and a high level prioritization roadmap to accelerate your advancement in the adoption of industry four technologies. So there's a lot that you could do, but what should you do? This assessment will support manufacturers in their industry for investment decision-making to promote a successful early adoption. Now, Callaghan Innovations providing fully funded opportunities to assess your facility through this process. And that links into the second activity as part of the Industry 4 Demonstration Network Program, and that's the network of site visits. So the network of site visits is designed to encourage sharing of Industry 4 knowledge across the sector. So whether you're well into your Industry 4 journey or just starting out, the program provides a range of opportunities, case studies, webinars, and factory visits to expand your understanding of Industry 4 and learn, enable you to learn from others who have already embarked on their Industry 4 journey. Now, 
Oasis Engineering applied for a fully funded SIRI assessment in year one of the Industry 4 Demonstration Network program, and obviously were successful. As part of the program, they opened their doors to manufacturers to share their knowledge and learnings. And this webinar series is another channel uh, to share progress and updates with a wider audience. So we're excited to hear their progress um, over the last two years. Now, the third activity is the mobile showcase led by Becca, which takes the form of a chocolate sorting mini production line, yum, equipped with several advanced industry four technologies. So Becca will have a conversation with your teams about the application of these technologies, share some successful implementation stories and give you hands on time with the gear and outline what support is available to help you apply the technology in your business. So please refer to the industry4.govt.nz website to access all of the case studies, webinar recordings, and upcoming events for the final year of the Industry 4 program. I'm delighted to now invite Jonathan Lee, Operations and Quality Manager at Oasis Engineering to share an overview of Oasis and the progress they have made around shop floor intelligence and the ability of their IT and OT systems at the shop floor layer to identify and diagnose any deviations and adapt to changing needs. Now, if you have any questions through the course of the webinar, please use the Q&A functionality at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and I'll direct those questions to Jonathan at the conclusion of his um, presentation. So thank you, Jonathan, for joining us today, and I now hand the baton over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so yeah, Shopfloor Intelligence, um, this, is, this is us. We're part of um, Alloflex. So um, a German company uh, who manufactures, um, if you go to the petrol station anywhere in New Zealand, you pick up the Bowser and fill your car. So Alloflex makes a lot of that sort of stuff. So um, Oasis, we design, develop and produce um, CNG, which is compressed natural gas and hydrogen pressure equipment. So in the picture, you can see sort of a range of the components we manufacture. We've got um, ball valves and check valves and, and refueling systems for, for these gases. So to make that, we manufacture a lot of that out of raw bar stock. So a lot of it's um, stainless steel, um, a lot of CNC machinery. So machine up and, and make all the individual components. We then assemble and test those and, and then ship them around the world to, to over 20 countries. Um, with that, obviously 90% of our sales come from export. There's not a lot of um, CNG and stuff in New Zealand. So um, really, really big in the export. Currently our team's at 45 and growing. I think I heard um, we've employed 20 new people in the last year. So um, a lot of changes going on at Oasis and a, a lot of work <laughs> happening to try and keep everyone on the same page. Um, and yes, we completed the serious assessment back in um, December, 2020. It was really good. I think um, I was part of the assessment team on that. My thoughts going into it were, oh, we know what we need to do. We need to automate and we need to get more data and, and things like that. But it was actually really good to understand it in the different sort of um, classes that they talk about and, and the different ways. Um, and it did transpire that kind of what we thought aligned with what the assessment said, what was new and what we did get out of it was sort of the lack of um, some expertise. So we were, we were quite good, competent people that are able to run the projects and, and do that side. But what was lacking was sort of the programming and the IT side of it. So um, yeah, from the serious assessment, the MD was able to, to strike up a deal with um, a local company to get a bit of part-time time, time um, for someone who can help us with all of that. So in the past year, what have we been doing? Um, so manual planning board, we we traditionally, this is how we planned everything through um, manufacturing. So if you look at the picture at the red square, 
those are the jobs um, for the individual components to be machined tomorrow. And so we schedule tomorrow's jobs based on uh, a constraint, the factory constraint, which we've identified as the lathe, um, a turning operation. And then there's also milling operations. With the lathe being the constraint, we purely only you know, schedule that time. So we schedule uh, 27 hours a day. And when that day is full, you have to move on to the next day. The other side of the coin is we, we also plan for every part to be manufactured within five days. So it goes out to production. We expect it to be out of production five days later. And that's how this board works fundamentally. Um, there's different cards for different things. There's sales opportunities where we can, which are reserved spaces so we can pull jobs forward into um, and, and other things going on. So when a, we use a Kanban system, so um, the part gets used in an assembly, a Kanban card gets triggered, it goes to the production office and they load a new job in our ERP system called Estendo. Um, so the production manager is looking at this magnetic board, looking for where the spaces are. Um, he knows the, the job he's trying to load, how many hours worth of constraint time that is, picks a date, oh yep, that looks good loads the job into a stendo, prints out the pack, um, prints out a magnet and puts it on this board and that's scheduled. That was working well, it was really awesome for us for, for years and years and years. Um, but what's happened really recently is our lead time, which um, has always been at four weeks, basically to the customer, began to grow out massively. We we're out, out 10 weeks plus um, and, and systems sort of began to break down. So um, we found that reorganizing jobs meant that Stendo didn't have the current data. So if, if um, there's an urgent need for a job, so you find that ticket on the board, um, try and find the, the, what you need and, and you're moving these tickets around, which, which for the plan works really well. But if you don't update Stendo, um, it means that the data in there is wrong about when the due dates will be. We also found at 10 weeks, um, finding jobs is really hard. So Jack wants to find um, a particular part. When's that gonna be due? Estendo's wrong because the data's all been moved around. When is it actually gonna be due? You gotta look through this manual board and try and find all of that. So a lot of frustration with, is it in production? Is it still waiting to be done? We didn't know what's going on. The, the bigger problem we found was with the long lead times, our replenishment systems began to fail. So our Kanban, it all been tuned for sort of this four week lead time turnaround. Um, and as soon as we're out at 10 weeks, we get a Kanban card triggered uh, and we don't only option is to plan it in for 10 weeks away. And that means that we run the risk of running out of product. So what do we do? We, we oh, will we'll, we'll make twice as much as we normally do. Um, or I'm making some of these now, I'm gonna make some extra knowing that um, we're going to run out. So we're preempting the Kanban card. So, so the whole process of, of how we worked sort of ended up changing. Um, and what that does is you're making double batches and makes your lead time go longer. So it's not really helping at all. Um, with the manual board, we found it very hard to see all of the priorities. So a Kanban card might be triggered. Someone's pulled the last part and, and off it comes. But there might not be any demand. Like We might not need it. Um, anytime soon, but because we run a FIFO sort of system with the Kanban cards, a job would get loaded on the system and it would get pushed through along with all the urgent jobs and um, we just really couldn't see what was going on. The other thing was um, we relied a bit on a lot on the knowledge of a few people, so production manager um, has done a lot of work, knows each part integrantly um, and so we actually found that although we expect parts to take five days to machine, sometimes when there's anodizing or hardening after we've manufactured it, we're not actually going to receive it in five days. It might be 10 days or 12 days. So they would automatically um, put the ticket for machining earlier on the board. Um, and no one really knew the sort of the logic behind that. So to try and alleviate all these sorts of problems that we're having, we, we looked to into sort of digital systems. So here we have our current digital system. Um, it's 
basically a replication of the manual way of doing things. So each day is um, a allotted number of hours. Um, and then we are able to um, put more information in behind this. So to carry on, um, jobs are loaded in Ascendo and then they automatically show on this digital planning board. So this is a, a web-based kind of planning board replicating the manual one. Um, the, the other side of it is that we can then rearrange things on this board and it will update Ascendo. So um, all the dates get replicated back. We developed this using a, an, an internal programming resource. So I mentioned before, we actually share um, some time of the Estendo um, expert. So is able to link really well to the ERP system and develop um, the, the, these sorts of apps and things like that. So it's been a really good um, you know, thing to, to go through. The other thing we did is we did it with um, the production manager and some of the other people who who use the production board. That was really important. They were quite attached to their magnets on the board and, and worried about lots of things not happening. And what happens if, if the board goes down? How can we sort of have backup processes and things in place? Um, and the one thing I would say about trying to implement something digital was that um, you, you need someone alongside them who's able to push them daily. So I wasn't able to be there every day in the production office sort of collating the issues, but um, we were able to have someone in there was like, well, you know, why don't we do it this way and, and, um, and sort of help the long in that process. So we had some immediate improvements going to digital. So obviously jobs moved on the board, updated in Ascendo. We're at easy searching. So control F, you can find a job or a part number, um, or again, in Ascendo, the data is actually correct. Um, Every day I mentioned uh, you're, we're at 27 hours production every day. So you have to manually add up the, the tickets. Um, and so now it's just automatically adding up. That's what's in the, the green boxes in the below. Um, you can see each day, you can see how many days are there and that will keep track. Some of the more important things that we've done was um, the color system. So we, we can now see um, the demand, so the, the urgency of jobs. So the color system we've gone with is, is purple. So you'll see a few purple tickets scattered through here. These are Kanban cards, which have been loaded into the system. Uh, and there's no demand, so we're not needing to sell any. And we have plenty in stock. So we, we, it gives the guys um, doing the schedule some spaces that they could consider using that space or pushing those jobs back because they are not immediately needed and they can straight away see that. Um, the collection of institutional knowledge. So I mentioned before the, the lead time of five days plus external processes. So we've introduced, we've managed to collate that and collect that as we go with this process. So the production manager does what they've always done, loads a job for a particular day, then moves it forward on the board. In the background, it's collecting that, that lead time. Um, so if the next time you raise that same part number, it will automatically move it to that um, far further ahead to allow for those things. Um, and reducing waste in other departments. So we actually, which was a, what wasn't expected at all, but um, both the production and the, what we call the product development department, both utilize um, the production board uh, and, and particularly the the product development department do a lot of um, off-site work and, and work from home. So they're able to check up on the parts that they're getting made, see where they are in the schedule, see what time they have available for other projects and, and work well into this. Um, the future is, is what really excites us with this. So this is, we see this as a, as a building block, um, trying to scale it up fast. Uh, so we can, we can do some simple things um, straight away. So tracking of raw materials. So you'll see some blue ticks um, scattered amongst the cards. And these are components or jobs that have the material on site. Um, it's been cut, all the programming information's there for the machines. And we know we can just go straight to production with that. So we have a hard rule that nothing goes to production without all of the information. So currently that's a manual process. Um, 
there's travelers and there's things traveling around the company to track that information and it eventually comes back to uh, the production office where they tick it. Um, so in the future, hopefully soon, we can at least get uh, when that material for that job is receipted in, we can show that directly on these cards. And then also gives us the chance to prioritize cut lists for the saw. So there might be 50 jobs at the saw um, and, and all they know is they need to do, get them cut. But we can say, oh, these are the jobs that are next due um, and, and keep on top of that. Paperless, so currently we print the traveler um, when we load the job. But if anything moves, the due dates or quantities, things like that, that traveler can become obsolete. Uh, so yeah, it gives us the chance to, now that we know the information is correct, um, we can print that information directly um, when we need it or completely get rid of sort of paperless sort of stuff. Um, and automation and smarter job scheduling. So this is sort of our holy grail is that why, why do we need to have Kanbans coming to the reception, to, to office or why do we even need to load those purple tickets? They're obviously not needed. So um, we should only be loading jobs for what's required when it's required um, and the quantities we need. So we think we can get a lot further down the track of, of sort of self-scheduling and self-automating systems, um, particularly from, from what's needing to go out in sales orders. We know what we need to send out. So why can't we use that a lot better? On the shop floor, a bit of um, data that we collect out there. So um, here we have um, on each machine uh, a Pi, Raspberry Pi computer, um, which collects the what we call the uptime and downtime of the machine. So it knows when it's machining or it knows when it's stationary. Fairly simple sort of signals. Um, so if you look at machine A, um, all the green boxes up the top uh, while the machine is is running, so it's it's working, and then the the red is when it's stationary. Or so in this case, this is an automated um, sort of system. So you can see it's very uniform um, going through. All the red bits are when the machine stopped, but it's automatically loading the next piece of material in. And then you can see the manual area, manual machine. Sorry, um, again, all the green boxes are the same width. So the, the time it's actually machining is the same, but what's different is, is all of the red boxes are quite different. So you can see um, a very small red one. Obviously they were standing right there, ready to load the part in, off they go. And then you can begin to question what's happening in those red zones. So, um, you know, is it, does this person need extra support or are they distracted or, you know, doing things like that? So we've actually, recently found that um, we've had a lot of phone use on some machines and things like that. So we can see machine by machine, by machine what's going on and, and, and um, whether or not, you know, we're getting consistent stuff. So we've only sort of recently worked out how to interpret this information a bit better. Um, we've had the data for a while. Some of the other things we do uh, with this is um, getting realistic cycle times. So we need to make sure that we're getting, you know, good times back to planning so that we're loading jobs in or scheduling jobs in a realistic manner. Um, so yeah, we can, we can see over a longer period what is realistic rather than the guys going, oh, writing down a number and it's their best ever. One, one person writes their best ever and the other one writes their, their slowest because they don't want to be pushed too much. This sort of gives a, a better average, um, and you can sort of pick a, a zone that that you know is is typical, um, and and get that data back to production. Um, and lights out. So we do a lot of automated lights out machining, and what we've found is that actually sewing the machines down um, provides better tool life. It, the the wearing the cutting parts actually wear slower, so you can get more quantity out by going slower. So when the machine used to stop at 12 o'clock at night, because that was as many as we could do. Now we stop at three or four o'clock, but actually the quantity that we make overnight is, is, is greater. And so we use this data to, to help determine that. So we can see um, 
when so we don't need to sort of manually log the the time we started and when it finished and things like that we can see that directly from the starter so it it means that if you make a change you know the guys oh, I forgot to fill in the data log well actually you can just go straight on to onto this and and see the data and see whether it was worth it and whether or not the machine stopped Still sort of scratching the, the surface on some of this stuff. Um, we, we expect it to be able to fully integrate back into um, the scheduling and, and improving our stuff there. Um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of good thoughts around um, trying, to, trying to do that. Um, and the live feedback. So we, we have a, a visual board of all the machines and the jobs that they're running on. Um, and we can integrate uh, the data from these machines into into that visual board to show kind of the status and, and where things are at so team leaders can can keep an eye on them or or the machine operators themselves can can have a look um, yeah predicting lead times for customers so i mentioned our our lead time um, of four four weeks has, has been that for a long time um, and the other lead time we have so that's when so four weeks is when we need to manufacture some parts. For the majority of what we do, we try and do it within five days. So that's using our Kanban stock to just assemble parts and send them out. So we have this five day, four weeks. Um, all of a sudden it's all been blown out. Um, and you know, we're 10, 12, whatever it is. Um, what, what we still want to do though, is try and give the customer the best lead time. So where we've been, this, this process is sort of self-created itself where people are looking through the data in Estendo um, and trying to work out when we're gonna have stock available. And oh, if I move this job around, then I can promise the customer five weeks and they'll be happy enough with that instead of the 10 weeks and, and all of that, which, which we wanna do. We wanna do that for the customer. Um, but there's a lot of waste in that. And what ended up happening was the production manager, instead of focusing on sort of reducing the lead time, ended up focusing on um, giving the lead time and working out what um, was possible. And that's basically with, with every order. The other thing that wasn't helping was customers would find out the lead time was 10 weeks and they go, oh, well, I'll put a double lot on. Um, and then of course, that doesn't help the lead time anymore either. So what we did is we, again, worked with our um, internal um, programming guy and built a little app. So that's the top picture here. Um, basically really quickly, we, we scoped it out. So looked at what the current process, the production manager was doing. How can we streamline that? So he's going to each item in Estendo, looking up sort of the availability and when parts will be available or next made. Um, and making decisions by that line by line. So we are able to develop this where you put in the, the top level part number. So the, the, the valve that the customer wants, the quantity, and then it gives all of the items needed to make that. And then by week, how many we would have in stock. So in this case, it's all green. So yes, we could send the customer 10 um, valves within the, the next week. Um, if it had some red in there, then the production manager can look at his production board and say, okay, well, we could, if I move this job here, then we could do it sooner um, without affecting anything else. What we did here was, was, was really to get to minimum viable product as fast as possible. So it was literally quick scope of, of what um, we were doing. And then, um, what is the minimum? What do we have to do to, to make this usable? We, we identified fairly early on that we, what we were doing was not actually what we wanted to do long term. So it's just one thing I, I think is worth mentioning is, is you need to be careful not to automate a bad process or, or cause that fundamental shift just by giving the people the tools to, to give lead times. We were ingraining lead times and, and that's not where we want to be. We want to be back at four weeks so we did know that we did kind of discuss that um and and we saw it as a short-term solution to get production manager off um 
you know, develop, working out those lead times and back on to, to trying to sort out the actual lead time and then what more outsourcing we could do or other processes within the factory um, to try and try and sort it out. Um, yeah, so that's effectively, we, we were chasing the wrong root cause um, in this scenario. So that is the root cause is actually that our Kanban systems weren't holding up. We couldn't do a five days um, and we couldn't see what the priorities were. So we were making lots of stuff um, and it wasn't necessarily the right stuff. So in conjunction with the board, we've now got better visibility on what the priorities are. Um, and the Kanban side, um, what we did um, a while ago, we've contacted uh, work with a PhD student. So we've been working with them for a couple of years now. So that's the second picture here. So we've identified that the Kanban cards, as good as they are in sort of a really stable sort of environment or maybe 20% growth up or down, you can manage them. Um, once we start going beyond that, the, the quantities very quickly become incorrect and you start running out and things like that. So yeah, we've been working with this PhD student to give us sort of dynamic Kanban cards. Um, so the idea is that they are self-triggering signals and, and recommending a quantity and an urgency for that. So we should be able to give better diphotis and better delivery um, and better, you know, sticking to our five-day lead times because we've got the stock. But also we should be able to optimize what we're not needing, make less of what's not actually needed. Uh, so yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good work there. So to explain this graph, we've got um, green is the reality. Um, so that's what's actually happened. And so you can see we've, we've ended up with more, more at this point, and also we've got less at this point, and that's actual data. The purple is what has been simulated. So the peaks and troughs are, are better. Um, so keeping a more stable, Backbin helps with um, inventory. So we're not got these massive, um, when we started having to make larger Kanban amounts, we found there wasn't enough space on the racks to put all the stock. So it reduces that. And then also has been, um, has more safety stock as well. So um, overall is a, is a better option. Uh, tablets. So um, we've been using tablets for a long time. Um, well, for, for a couple of years. Well, I think we had them just before Siri. Um, so we have that linked to Ascendo. The, they're in both assembly and production departments. Um, so we're able to um, give all the information needed for a particular job. Uh, so that's all the SOPs, the drawings, things like that. Um, the, we use those to clock in and out of um, the visual update, the visual board. So that's the picture below. So we have different processes in assembly. We've got a picking process where we go and get all of the components um, ready. So high pressure, highly flammable gases. We don't want anything like an O-ring or something left out. So we'll go and count up 10 O-rings and make sure we've got them all. And so on the tablet, they're able to go, okay, yep, the job's picked, ready to go to um, get assembled. So much like the blue tick um, in production board, nothing gets started until we know we've got all of the components, everything's available, saves all that waste on the shop floor of having to go and, oh, where's this thing and stopping the line and all of that. So nothing goes on until it's all picked. Once they start assembling, the color will change again. Um, and again, when they finish assembly, there's also a testing color. So I think that's the blue one. So that's been tested. Um, and when we know it's good to, to send after that point. The um, collection of results and testing reports. So again, in the background, we're able to use that data of when particular um, stages of assembly are completed to improve our planning. Uh, so we can see how long particular jobs are taking, whether we need a bit more training um, and, and really dive into that information. The other advantage of, of actually having a tablet on, on the, in the assembly is, is the SOPs. So um, previously, before they were all digitized, you know, we had these laminated SOPs with vivid marks all over them. 
um, and scribbles and, and signed off by so and so on this date. And they'd never really get updated. It was it was a big big mess of of notes, and then people would get confused, or the photos would would be out of date and things like that. So there's actually extra advantages of having um, the tablets and and there's sort of equipment out in those areas. So we use uh, a, like a web based program called Trello. So the assembly department are able to take a photo directly of what they're looking at. They say, oh, it's not right to the SOP take a photo, sends it to Trello, that um, up, we can then go through an update process. So we've actually got some, some good buy and someone from the assembly um, shop floor is able to do the updates. Um, so they update the SOPs, goes through a review process. Um, and then we use Trello to track all that process. Um, that's then fed back to the assembly department, SOPs updated next time. It's, there it is. So yes, yeah, some some side advantages to having um, more industry for sort of technologies. Um, and that's pretty much the last year or two of what we've been doing. Um, yeah, so there's part of the Aliflex group, um, a whole bunch of other companies that that's really good. We we share um, a monthly meeting with with them. So trying to tap into you know bigger multinational company. Um, stuff so they they do a lot of technology stuff as well so yeah it's really good to be able to work with other companies in the in the in the range yeah that'd be me great thanks thanks jonathan those are great insights um, that you've shared with us we've got um we'll head into the the q a now so i encourage everyone to um pop some questions into the um, into the Q&A chat and I'll start directing those uh, to Jonathan uh, now. So here we go, Jonathan, brace yourself. There's a few coming through. <laughs> so what package are you using for the digital planning board? Uh, the digital planning board. So yeah, it's a it's a web based system. So um, yeah, we we sort of developed it ourselves with the programmer. Um, so it uses API to, to get the information in and out of Ascendo. Um, and then we're able to, to distribute this and, and, and organize it as we want. Um, I didn't, um, it runs on, we've got a touchscreen TV. Um, so in the main production office, instead of this massive whiteboard, we've got touchscreen TV, which they can move the tickets around. And then we can also access it on, on any computer just with um, the web page. So yeah, that's how we've set that up. Awesome. Does the planning board have dra uh, drop and drag functionality um, on the boxes to move production around? Yeah, so I think I just answered that. So yeah, any one of these tickets, you just pick it up and move it to where you want. Um, and that updates into a Stendo. Um, so what actually happens is on the, the month, this is the Monday the 26th, you see that box. That is essentially the next day. So that's when I took the screenshot. All those jobs are the ones due for production. Um, and when they move to production, we drag them into the assigned to production box. So currently beyond that, it's a manual process. The, the magnetic tickets go out to production and they go on to what we call the five day buffer board. When I talked about taking five days to get the job done, they track it every day, those, those tickets move across. So now we've got a list of the things that have gone into production and when they went into production, we know that. So yeah, another another extension of this is that five day buffer board um, can be can be fully automated and and um yeah, a lot better. Great. Are you driving your ERP system or are you being driven by it? I think we're driving it. Um, I think yeah, Siri Siri said that well, you know, a lot of that was we saw that it's really important to have all that information in one place. Um, so we've chosen the ERP to be to be that, and we're we're able to to work with it and use it as we want. So PhD students accessing it, um, the board accesses it, all those tablets they all access that information. Um, and I don't think it's to to date it hasn't really been a a difficult thing to get what we want done. Um, yeah, we're not having to, to do it in any, any particular way. We're not having to here. We, you know, we, we, I always, I don't, I don't like automating bad processes. So um, 
you know, we try and work out the, the best way to do it manually and then make it suit from there rather than trying to do it digitally and then try and make everything fit around that. It just doesn't make sense for me. Right. Okay. Um, does the cutting bay have its own mini digital schedule? So, yeah, that, that is a, a future sort of thing that we're, we're keen on. So, yeah, its own tablet. It can have a priority list. Um, and all of that's just possible because we have taken this, the first step um, of digitizing the production board. Um, prior to that, you know, we didn't know if the material was on site, so it shouldn't be on the cut list. Um, we didn't really know the, the dates were correct in the stendo or not because everything had moved, so the priorities weren't right. So, yeah, we see see a tablet there by the by the saws and um, yeah, a, a clear list of, of what's needed next. Do the machine operators record their time against each job or one cost bucket for the day? Um, so the machine operators, so we didn't touch much on them. They also have tablets. So they get um, the logging on and off their jobs. So we know when um, they've started. So much like assembly, um, there's a production dashboard like the bottom picture here. Um, and yeah, each machine says I'm in setup, I'm running and I'm finished. And, and that is how we can see the, the total time for each job. All right. Um, oh, a bit of positive feedback, Jonathan, um, before, <laughs> before this person asks their question. Awesome work, um, Jonathan. Thank you. <laughs> um, what as assumptions have you been able to challenge through this visibility of data and how has that changed challenged mindsets on problem solving and what's possible yeah so i think the 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 challenging part for me is 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 are we making the right things at the right time um that you know with this massive blowout of of the lead time um there's all this worry or thought that um we're making the wrong things how can we be that busy and and, and our stock value is going up so we're not necessarily putting everything that we're making out the door. So we're making extra stuff um, just because. So yeah, that's the, the biggest thing I think that we're able to challenge with this. We're just starting on the track with that, with the purple tickets mm -hmm. and, and um, so the priorities, but yeah, more of that, more of the, the smarter planning and scheduling is where I see it going. Awesome. What type of tablets are you using? Uh, they're just uh, Samsungs. I think they're the 10 inch, 10.1 inch Samsungs, a, a tab 10, I think. Just a fairly simple one. Okay. How did the team there feel about, oh, how did the team there feel about the introduction of uh, Industry 4 technology and how did you bring them on the journey? Um, on the shop floor, it was reasonably easy in assembly. Um, they, they had much better information. I guess I mentioned the SOPs, how confusing they were. So that was a good driver to, to getting the information into and paired up with Ascendo. Um, they were able to get, you know, but previously they, they basically had to pick which, choose which SOP. We didn't even know if we're making part A, which SOP number we should be doing. So we were able to go, okay, A, B, C, these are the part numbers for those SOPs and, and really link it across um, so a lot of the other side of it is, is we kind of made it, particularly for assembly, impossible not to use that process. Um, so they really have to, in order to do the job, it's a key part of it. Um, so yeah, I think that, that really drove it in assembly. In, in production, I'm gonna admit it's a bit harder. They, we don't necessarily see, well, they don't see the value in, in saying oh, I've started my job and I've finished my job. Um, what I like to put into is is a bit of a, a diphotus essentially in, in the production area so that we can use that data a bit smarter and, and record and measure ourselves against how many jobs we are completing on time. And that that coming from the tablets, I think will help drive um, you know a better use of them. Okay. Uh, how much of the customer's involvement did this program require? Things like advanced, purchase information, et cetera? Customers, not a lot um, because we, 
our customers are purchasing what they what they are purchasing. Um, we're we're seeing that demand in the system, so we're just scheduling to make sure that we're meeting that. Um, what what's been really hard with the customers is the communication, um, particularly in in times when our lead time's gone through the roof. You know, we've got different salespeople who got preferred customers that they want to look after and, and things like that. Um, so they're all sort of looking at, you now they've all got access to this board. They can all sort of look at it and they can all kind of play and, and tweak, tweak it themselves without the production manager. So that is, is one thing of one downside of making it really open. Um, but I think now that we've, we've, we've been through that and we've managed to sort of identify, okay, we want to look after our top, top 10 customers. They're the ones that we give preferential treatment to. Um, and then beyond that, it's a it's a separate conversation. Um, so yeah, now the sales guys can look at this, but they don't necessarily play with it because it's the production manager's sort of area. All right, going well, Jonathan. How much of the process uh, you went through? Oh, wait a minute. How much of the process you went through led to where you ended up? Could you have gone from where you were two years to this point in one step if you knew what the current state looked like? Um, I guess it's a hard one. I, I definitely say that um, without at least the digital board, there'd be no way we would have um, managed, I think, the way as well as we have. Um, could we have gone shortcutted it? I think, yeah, I, th I think we, we spent about four months, I guess, really developing the board um, with the IT guy. Um, and that was, we were doing weekly um, what we call weekly Kaizans. So um, just every week going, okay, what's the next thing? What's the next MVP, the minimum viable product? What do we what do we need to do to get to there? And then, you know, sort of stepping it up until we got to something that was fully usable. Um, so I don't think we probably could have done anything different in that, in that arena when we were talking about this. Um, yeah, it's just where, I guess, there's a lot of things that could be done um, it's really where is the constraint in, in all of it and, and working on, on that thing. So, yeah, we could have made the, the tablets better or, or some other things, but we, we chose to focus on, on this. So, yeah, some things it feels like we could shortcut and go straight to a final solution, but it's not actually worthwhile because it's not the constraint. Okay. How long did the process take to go from manual to automated end to end? Yeah, so that was... That was, as far as the digital board, about four months. Um, that was with the IT person working a couple of two or three days a week on it. Um, yeah, a few um, breaks in between. Um, but yeah, that was that's how long that one took. The the tablets and the other things were a bit faster, a um, bit more sort of um, given solutions with with some of that. Ballpark, how many jobs orders are you processing at any one time? Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> I think, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Did you look at existing um, manufacturing execution systems? We, we tried. Um, nothing we could find um, sort of did what we wanted and sort of with our, with our end goal, our top of the mountain of, of the automated um, scheduling and that sort of side and working with our constraints and, and the way that we, we like to work, we couldn't find anything. Um, so yeah, we decided to go with the, the you know, custom solution from, from there. Um, so we, as I said, I, we talked to every month, we talked to um, Aliflex, so massive, massive company in Germany, and mm -hmm. I've got all the, all the money to buy fancy software and things. And even still, they, they don't get what, what we think we can get with this so it's we couldn't see it um, working did you consider um, a plm solution to manage your parts data no we did not okay uh, a good point there. yeah you mentioned using external resources um, what resources have you committed to the industry for initiatives so yeah, I guess a bit of my my time. Um, so we, we run um, Kaizen's. So every everything we do around here, process change wise, um, we have this weekly meeting and and um, and make the changes through that. We try not to take um, resource away from 
the production, particularly when it's really busy. Um, so yeah, we've we've used a lot of my time. Um, the the key stakeholders, which are norm more, normally more the manager guys, so the, the work carries on. Um, and and yeah, the, the external resource. I guess that's a bit different to how we would normally do lean and 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 um, other shop floor continuous improvement stuff, where we we do focus a lot more on the on the shop floor guys, um, and 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 we do allocate time for those projects. Um, it I expect um, we will start pulling them in more and more um, as as people get a bit more ingrained into into this and and see what's going on. But for the moment, it's been mainly yeah office space. Okay, how, how would you adjust for changes in capacity on an operation, i.e. still staff away or a new machine for the planning board? Yeah, so we, we built that in. So um, we're constantly buying new machinery that's going to fix a lot of our lead time issues, increase capacity. So you yeah, very, very MVP. There's, a, there's another location on the web page you can go to um, for settings behind a simple password sort of protection. Um, and you can change the number of days or hours per day, or um, we've got some machines that we purely schedule um, individually. So you can add another machine individually. So yeah, we've, we've allowed for that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, in this. Great. Does the fact that you've adopted the system technology, does it give you a competitive edge against your peers? And does it provide you a better profile against potential customers? Um, competitive edge, I'd say yes. Um, where when we were real, when everyone was really busy, we were getting winning some customers. Even still being at ten weeks, we were hearing, oh, but you know the other people were fifty two weeks. Um, so ten weeks isn't so bad. Um, where we still are really worried that you know we need to get back to four weeks as soon as we can. Um, we think this will help. Um, piece of the puzzle. Uh, but yeah, the as far as winning cus, uh, what was the other one? Sorry. It was two parts to that. Uh, provide, uh, does it provide you a better, uh, whoops, another question came in. Does it provide you a better profile against potential profile. customers? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure it does on that so much. Um, yeah, hopefully you, you guys are enjoying it, but um, not too many customers in New Zealand. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure we would get um, the overseas yet. Okay, I assume most of your parts are standard. Do you make custom parts? How do your systems work when dealing with custom parts? So yeah, as far as custom goes, so yeah, we we develop and sell our own components. So we're not a jobbing shop. Um, and we, we put all the processes in behind for that. What we do do custom is um, development work. So you can see on this board, uh, all of the yellow tickets are what we call product development tickets. So they get six hours a day. It's only four days a week um, to make whatever they want. So they can load in time into those spots. So that time is reserved. It's counted within the, the, the total. They can move that ticket across, load their own proper job into a Stendo. It'll turn up there. It'll know that it's a PD job, so it'll stay yellow. Um, and the PD guys work with that um, in there. So yes, in the background, it's better to have, you know, every part with all the information behind it, but the system does allow us to, to reserve and, and schedule in time when we don't have all of the CAD programs and everything else necessarily sorted. Um, okay. And the other side is, is, sorry, there's some orange tickets, which are just manual notes. And you can, when you create those, you can assign a number of hours to that. So we do things like maintenance once a month. We manually, we put a ticket on to the board for a day, essentially once a month goes towards maintenance and then that gets redistributed as needed. Okay, we just have a follow-up que uh, question to the one about external resources. How many man hours of external resources do you use? Um, I, has, it, you know, has it been a full-time IT person? Yes, yeah, so that's that sharing with the Stendo guy. So current budget's two days a week. Um, and that's included in, in all these projects, plus sort of a bit of support and things like that. Um, that we're also, you know, working with um, other things outside of this. So AP invoicing, we're trying to do automating um, invoices and, and trying to do accounts and sides and, and other things as well. So um, we will focus on a project at a time and get that nailed to MVP, 
get it working and then move on to the next thing. And then wherever the company constraint is or whatever is holding it up, we'll put that resource into that. So about two, two days a week. Okay. Uh, what ERP system are you using? I think. So it's called Astendo. Um, Astendo. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, done by Development X. Um, yeah, the local um, rep here is Calvin. Um, he's, he's, he's good to work with. Um, yeah, does a good job. Mm. Actually, I've got another one here about the ERP. How do you find the support from your ERP provider when developing the solutions? Yeah, again, yeah, we find it good. We work we're, we're, Quite closely with them um, for the he works um, they often come here and work out of a, a, another office sometimes so they sort of share around mm. in, the, in the area um, and work on site a little bit okay um, how did you launch uh, these digital changes to the shop floor team and get their buy-in to the shop floor um, or, or to, to I guess to it was quite difficult with the digital board to make that actual commitment to, to go in fully digital. We were trying to run two boards um, at one point, you know, and that just causes all sorts of issues because there's two systems going on. Um, so we managed to convince them that, that you know, we'd put enough work into it and it was stable enough to, to stop using the manual board. On the shop floor, it's, it's always a difficult one. Um, my advice is that um, it's got to be, got to be useful. It's got to be a key part of the process. Um, and, and from there, I think it, it grows. Um, it's, yeah, that's, that's sort of how we've set it up. Okay. Uh, we've got a comment here. Uh, sector development or impact, if the planning board learnings or design is useful for others in this call, could this be used as a starter across different industries and be eligible for the here uh, grant up to $4 million co-funding, which is focused on impact to the ecosystem. MB had an intro call on this also at 11 a.m. today. Okay. okay. Thank right. you. I'm not sure exactly on the, the grant side, but um, yeah. I don't think we we claim to own it per se. We're happy to work with, with people to, to um, you know, develop it and, and see where it goes. Right. Okay, I think well, there might be just one more question in the in the chat. Let me just check. I've asked. Um, uh, okay, do you have any learnings from selecting tablets that work well in a shop floor environment? Any specs that are particularly important to ensure they function well in that environment? Not so much with the tablets. Um, we've got two or three different types. It's best if you can get all one, uh, makes your placement a bit easier. Um, what we find a little bit hard, I think we're like 15 tablets now, keeping them all sort of good with the same information, sorry, in the, in the apps and, and that sort of stuff is a little bit of a challenge. What we've done on the machines, so the boys out there on the machine shops, are, they're a bit rougher. Um, we've mounted them to the to the benches, um, so they're up off the bench. We did hit break a few screens and things, um, just but now they're in a in a simple case off the bench, easy for them to see and, and use. Assembly, they're constantly picking these up and down um, to 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 look at information. So theirs is is in a in install a holder. We actually just three D print a holder, put it on the on the bench, um, and go from there. So yeah, particular type, not so much. What did really help us is, is a good well, sort of Wi-Fi system and a good network system. So um, Alaflex suggested that we, we put this in and we were sort of a bit hesitant, but I think it's one of the, the good things that we've, we've, we've listened to them. And then the MD always says there, yeah, without, without that, we, we would be nowhere. So um, yeah, more so important to get the network right. The tablets, from my experience, are just a tablet and they seem to work. Right, I am looking at the time. You have done exceptionally well, um, Jonathan. You have um, answered just over twenty questions, so well done. And there's a few cool. few more in the, a few Coming more through. in the, the, the chat. But what we can do is um, direct those to you um, post webinar, and perhaps we can share some of the responses to those questions after the webinar. So um, thank you, thank you so much, um, Jonathan, for your time today, um, for sharing so many valuable um, insights with us all. 
Um, to those of you um, on, the, on the webinar, I hope the outcome from this uh, forum and the insights shared has provided you all with much needed uh, support. We are on um, a journey of continuous improvement ourselves, so would be really appreciated if you could please complete the very quick survey, um, which you will see on your screen as you um, exit um, the webinar. Please do reach out to us for guidance and direction at any time. We're all working really hard to get you the information, advice, support, resources you need um, to support our manufacturing sector. There's so much amazing capability in business as you have just seen today um, with Jonathan's um, sharing. So the more we can do to help each other out there um, at the moment via forums, forums such as this, the better. So please do go to industry4.govt.nz to access all the resources and upcoming events we have scheduled over the next um, few months. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, look forward to seeing you at the next webinar and have a great day.